is all about forensicating um, endpoint artifacts in the world of cloud storage services. So this is going to be my who on my page. Again, my name is Renz and Chris. Uh, I'm working as a DFIR or Digital Forensics and Incident Responder. I'm currently working here in Dubai. Um, I was a former member of NCSA or what we call the National Cybersecurity Agency that is based in one of the countries in Middle East. Um, I'm also a co-founder of Guidem. So Guidem is the uh, one of the leading training uh, provider in, based in the Philippines. Uh, we do specialize um, in cybersecurity courses such as um, VAPT and uh, cyber defense and threat hunting there. Um, I've also accepted to various conferences uh, before. Uh, I'd like to send a lot of um, CFP submissions um, in, in all various uh, B-Sides uh, conference uh, all over the world. So I get accepted uh, in B-Sides London, uh, also in B-Sides Vancouver in year 2019. Uh, I presented last year uh, for B-Sides Doha and as well as in Rootcon Philippines. And now I'm very, very grateful uh, and also very honored to be part of NorthSec 2021. So shout out to all the NorthSec staff out there. Uh, so this talk, so this is just to uh, clear some confusions because when they saw my title, cloud services, cloud storage services, they might think of um, the big three in the business. So this talk is not primarily uh, related to the big three uh, cloud service providers such as Amazon or AWS, uh, Google Cloud Platform or Microsoft Azure. So this is something that I'll probably do in the near future. Uh, most commonly like IR or forensics um, uh, type of um, talk uh, to AWS or how you can, can conduct um, incident response to Microsoft Azure kind of thing, but not for now, okay? So my talk is all about uh, common footprints or artifacts uh, that leaving behind on the endpoints. Once you install the following cloud, excuse me, cloud storage applications. So these are the primarily cloud storage apps that you can see that enterprises use it. So normally there are two versions of, of this. So one for personal and then second is the business. So the personal is typically uh, consumed by the consumers, like me, the users, the normal users. Um, and then the business version is kind of more on the enterprise level. So the business version is, um, this This actually uh, interesting because business version includes a lot of added features um, like files on demand, uh, different retention times or dates uh, for deleted items, of course, and the more uh, robust logging capability. But on this talk, we're going to just showcase um, more of the personal version of it. So, uh, you know, you can think of uh, in a world of um, where the most important files are residing, probably in third party systems. So how can we effectively accomplish this kind of investigations? Is there anything left on the endpoint that is used for forensic analysis? So that is the main topic for today. That is what I'm going to discuss uh, to, to, to promote or to just showcase those forensic goodness of for predominate cloud storage apps. So which are the, uh, the Dropbox, the OneDrive um, box, and lastly, the Google Drive. And these are my agenda. Why do we care? Why do we need to talk about this as an IR or as a digital uh, forensicator or a forensic examiner? Uh, what are those top cloud storage services? And uh, what are the footprints, the the artifacts that it leaves behind and those metadata or informations that we can use as part of our evidence. And of course, how can we acquire these things? Where can we acquire it? What are the default locations? What are the directories? And lastly, my demo for today is um, all about CAPE usage. Uh, how can we leverage CAPE or how can we acquire or perform um, cloud storage artifacts X or acquisition in just less than a minute. So I've recorded a video, I'll just play around that later on. Now, 
the main question is this. So why do we care? So a lot of adversaries um, nowadays are using it. So adversaries may perform uh, data exploitation to uh, using the cloud storage provider or the, the apps that I've just discussed uh, rather than over their primary command and control channel. So cloud storage uh, services allow for the storage, allows for edit, uh, some retrievals of data, from a remote cloud server over the internet. So a couple of adversaries that are using cloud storage apps for data exfiltrations or purposes are, um, are listed on the monitor when you visited that. So that's going to be the, the sub-technique ID for that is T1567.002. So you can see that on the right side of my slide. So this is just a sub-technique over the exfiltration of our web service. Uh, so when you go there, you can see uh, most of the adversaries that's using it. So as you may know, like last week, I think there's a couple of news related to dark side ransomware. So they've been using that uh, like mega as part of their uh, data exploitation service. We just dump most of those confidential files that they got into this cloud platform. Chimera, uh, another APT or adversary that uh, they've used uh, or they've exfiltrated the stolen data over OneDrive using multiple accounts. Even Torda, Torda is not new. Uh, we've been hearing these even a couple of years ago. They've used OneDrive and Forshade for their exfiltration purposes. Half Neum, just a couple of months ago, like every security professionals are so busy just to patch their Microsoft Exchange servers, the on-premise ones, because of these Half Neum. And most of the customers that are infected by Half Neum are actually, um, they've seen that Half Neum attackers are using Mega just to dump all those files or all of those confidential data they just got for, for their victims. And lastly, Empire. So Empire um, can use Dropbox for data exploitation purposes as well. And why do we care? Um, of course, just like what I've just mentioned, uh, these can be heavily used as part of the data exploitations and sometimes using command and control. It can be trivial before, of course, but nowadays, these can be one of the favorite uh, exploitation method of, of adversaries, not just adversaries, but also uh, insider threats. So if you want to upload something, if you want to download something coming from your enterprise, coming from your company's laptop, just use cloud storage applications. Easy as that, you know? And also blue teamers, and especially the DFIR folks, are or, or we can leverage these kind of footprints, these kind of artifacts that are leaving behind because we can get a lot of information by extracting this, by parsing it, if we know where can we find it. So this will be a very good um, part of our forensics report in every cases that we have. And what are those evidences that we need to collect? So. Uh, we can collect a local and even cloud files. So these are the same files on the local drive or um, even on the cloud files. Uh, of course, databases and logs because we can see the value, a lot of values or beneficial um, um, be beneficials when it comes to getting most of the metadata that we need, including the modified timestamp, um, the file hashes, of course, the file size and the file name, etc. Deleted items, of course, every forensic examiner loves to examine deleted items as we'd like to know what they're trying to hide for some reason, right? OS artifacts or the operating systems artifacts. This could be a bunch of, um, I would say Windows artifacts like LNK files, jump lists, uh, registry entries, MFT or master file table, and even in memory dump, we can see a lot of volume over there, okay? Um, so endpoint uh, footprints, um, these are some of the categories um, that we can get from uh, using these uh, cloud storage applications. Are not surprising, really? Cloud storage applications leave a very large kind of footprints like this. So I have, I'm not going to mention everything here, but uh, by checking the local systems, you can see a lot of artifacts that can be very, very useful when you're trying to investigate some cases such as uh, like username, 
um, the uploads, the downloads, um, if ever a user shared something to another user or to multiple users. Um, the username, uh, the email address that they've used to authenticate into a cloud storage services, you can see those things into the endpoint. Okay. Um, okay, let's start with our first uh, cloud storage apps. So welcome to Dropbox. So one of my first ever storage, but also the worst. Okay. The worst, not in terms of features, not in terms of usability or user experience, but the worst cloud storage solution for forensic examiner. Why? It is difficult. It's difficult for a cloud storage to investigate as the primary databases of Dropbox are encrypted using a W or Windows Data um, API or the DP API, uh, which we will discuss in a bit. So once you decrypt, of course, it has been encrypted. So you need like um, a decryption tool or decryption keys for this. So once you decrypted it, it will be easy to navigate as it employs um, a decrypted format of SQLite database. So uh, most of these cloud storage applications are uh, using SQLite database, which are easy to understand, which is which are easy to parse and to navigate. So it used to be pretty straightforward. So this Dropbox thing, because they kind of use SQLite, uh, SQLite as their database before, but they've changed how they did things. Um, as you can see here, some of the local files are uh, residing on the Dropbox um, default folder. So this is the default folder or directory. Um, let's say you're trying to sync five gig of movies or a file to the cloud coming from your local files, then those files can be cached. So there will be a cache files or a, a temporary files container, which will be on a dot Dropbox cache folder. And this is the metadata. So the file cache, the DBX is the most important thing that you can get on Dropbox applications. So um, uh, there was a talk or uh, there was a talk uh, way back 2012 in Hack.lu, which is a conference um, in Luxembourg uh, by two great gentles or gentlemen on the topic of a critical um, analysis of Dropbox software security. So they've discovered that um, the encryption keys used for these DBX files is kept in the registry and it is protected using DP API keys. So that's why uh, by using um, a toolkit made by a Francesco Picasso. So he's a very good security researcher and also um, um, a former uh, science instructor. Um, so using his DP API toolkit, uh, we need to supply the username and password. And then that's the time that we can decrypt uh, the encrypted databases or the DPX files, such as the file cache and the config DPX um, on the Dropbox. So after that, after we decrypted that, then that's going to be an easy way for us to get things like the informations, the metadata of different files residing on the Dropbox. Okay, so let's welcome another one, which is OneDrive. So this is um, being noted as the most popular cloud storage. Let me think for a second why this is the most popular cloud storage. Because this is owned by Microsoft. This is owned by Microsoft, so that's why it's very popular due to the fact that it has been installed uh, by default since Windows 8 Plus. So in most cases, uh, you may see uh, on the default folder of OneDrive, but sometimes you can also see like SkyDrive. So SkyDrive is the old term or uh, the old name of OneDrive when Microsoft, uh, Microsoft acquired it. So uh, in OneDrive, there are two versions of it. So I'll just, just like what I mentioned before, there will be a personal and there will be a business. So the good thing about the business side, which we'll talk about, because we're just going to talk about the personal version, but just to talk a bit of the business version of OneDrive, um, the good thing about this is that it contains a unified audit logs or what they call UAL, wherein you can extract a report using the web applications of OneDrive and to get the audit, audit logs that contains a lot of information, very rich information that you can find on, on, on the OneDrive, such as IP address, uh, account names, uh, file tasks. Does uh, the user modify the files or does it been deleted? 
Uh, was it accessed by a user or whoever user may be? Uh, was it being copied by user or shared to everybody? So and so forth. But for this talk, uh, we're just gonna use OneDrive uh, personal only. Okay, so these are the local files as well. Uh, you can see that this will be installed under the user profile and then the OneDrive. And there will be also another register keys that you can see depending on the version of OneDrive. So as you can see here in the example, that this would be under the anti-user slash software Microsoft OneDrive accounts personal. But if you're reusing a business account, then you just have to change the personal into a business. So most of the metadata that you can see here are also useful when performing um, investigations, such as the sync diagnostic dot log. Um, it gives us the metadata for not just for the local files, but also for the cloud files. Um, the user SID, so this CID is not the SID of Microsoft or on the Windows that we probably know about. Uh, this is not the security identifier, but this is the user identifier that OneDrive provides uh, because you can have like multiple accounts. So that gives you um, like a unique identifier per user. So if you try to parse this user SID that, that it contains a list of uh, cloud uh, and some local file names. So this is just an example of um, the OneDrive that I have on my local laptop. So you can see that there are a couple of or, uh, different status icons. So there's a cloud uh, icon, there is a green check mark, and then there's a white check mark down there. So for the uh, cloud um, icon, these are the files or folder that is um, only in the cloud. So it's not existing on the hard disk itself, okay? But there, since there is this um, features called files on demand, you can probably see that on your local drive, but technically technically, it's not there. So once you image um, a certain hard drive and it has um, an icon like this, just a cloud, then it's not gonna be existing there. Okay, so there is also a green check mark, which is, uh, this is just a temporary cache. So uh, let's say if I open a certain file that has a cloud icon, then that would probably be in change as to a green check mark if we open it, okay? It means that it's just a temp, it's temporarily um, stored there. So it's not like permanently being there, okay? So sometimes let's say for some reason your, um, your hard disk uh, might be full, then this could be the first thing that will be deleted, okay? Um, on the uh, white check mark, then this is the file that has been always kept on this device. So if you right click on each file of this, then there will be an options of always keep this file locally. Okay, so once you click that file, then that means that this can be exists on the local disk as well as on the cloud instance okay so just you know don't be confused on this uh different icons on the onedrive so an example for that again um so this file or another metadata that we can leverage uh so this file so as you can see on the um, icon or on the arrow down here uh the this is the file with dat or that file is the user seed so this is how uh microsoft identifies whoever the user is this is not in a text file format. So what do we need to do? We need to parse it. So good thing we have bstrings. So uh, bstrings is uh, one of the tools of easy tools or from Eric Zimmerman uh, that we can use to get a bunch of strings of text, excuse me, to get more insights uh, related to the file uh, in OneDrive. So, uh, which I will uh, present later uh, on the next slide. And then the other one is the INI file. So the INI file contains a lot of good uh, information related to the last sync time, uh, usage, stats, um, et cetera. And then the response text, which is um, highly on a text file. This gives us the full name of a user who authenticated. And of course, the Microsoft account email that was just logged in. So on the next slide, as you can see here, that um, when I um, try to, to go on the directory of the OneDrive personnel, I can see that there is this that file. So when I perform bstrings.exe and then dash f, then I can see that these are the files that needs to be or are existing on the cloud instance. 
Okay, so we can easily see that. Even if you delete the file, it will still be there. So you can see the metadata of the files that have been deleted, which is very, very useful when it comes to incident response and digital forensics perspective. When I open the uh, profile service response text file, then that gives me the name of the user. And of course, the Microsoft account that was used to authenticate on OneDrive. So again, another useful artifacts or information, especially when you're dealing with, uh, or if you're in the middle of IR engagement. Now let's move on to the box. So box is um, the most, forensic friendly applications that we can deal with because uh, they're, you know, they're reducing SQLite databases that provide um, all metadata like um, timestamps, uh, like SHA-1 hashes uh, for online and offline files. So uh, again, uh, the local files will be stored on the user profile slash box, which is by default. Um, and it also uses a reparse point, which I'll talk about later on. And couple of metadata that you can see on the app data folder on the local box box, and there's a logs folder. Of, and also there is a data which contains the databases from the block, from the box itself. Um, so uh, sync uh, DB here, as you can see, um, this is um, uh, another metadata that we can open uh, via the, uh, the SQLA database browser. So it contains um, a lot of information such as uh, this, uh, like box items. So if you open sync.db, there will be a different tables or multiple tables, but the box underscore item is the most um, common that we can use for investigations or analysis. As you can see here, you can see the file names, you can see um, the modified time, uh, you can see the, the hash value, uh, the created and last modified time, as, as what I've said, these are all an epoch time, so you just have to convert it into a human readable format as you may prefer. Um, having a checksum is very useful, especially if you're trying to compare uh, one file to another. So that's a good thing. And that, that's the box. And also we have Google Drive. So I think most of the uh, Gmail users uh, uh, are very or pretty much aware of Google Drive because once you have a Gmail account, you'll probably have um, at least or a minimum or maximum of 15 gig of free cloud storage. I think that's uh, like a default uh, features or um, um, I'd say uh, advantage of having a Gmail account. So Google Drive has also these two versions. Uh, there is a Google Drive for uh, consumers and of course for business. So um, Google Backup and Sync. So this is now the new name of Google Drive that is being installed on the endpoint. So it re it replaces the uh, original uh, Google Drive applications since 2018. So it is now the default uh, desktop application for a consumer of Google Drive. So if you want to install uh, Google Drive on your desktop applications, the name has been changed into Backup and Sync. And then the other one is Google Workspace, or uh, they call it a G Suite uh, FS or the file stream or G Suite file stream. So it is available for uh, G Suite customers. Uh, almost the same features of backup and sync uh, with, of course, additional, um, like minimum additional features like files on demand. But still, the databases of, of the Google Drive is in a form of SQLite. So that's why it's also um, not that hard to parse and not that hard to examine. Uh, mo most of the metadata that we need from forensic standpoint are uh, sync uh, config.db, uh, cloud grab.db. This is the most important here in Google Drive because that contains the complete listing of the metadata that we need for our investigations. So as you can see here, uh, I've opened my own cloud uh, grab.db. So uh, almost the same on the back sides when I open uh, the database there. So it also contains the file name. Uh, it contains the modified time. So the modified time is uh, again in a Unix uh, epoch time format. Um, we also have ND5 hash here of the file so we can uh, again run some comparisons of the file. Uh, we also have here shared column, which means if it's one, then it is being shared. 
if it's zero, if the value is zero, it means not shared. So, you know, very, very common or very uh, no brainer. The doc type column here is kind of interesting because the doc type number one value, excuse me. So if we have a value of one a doc type, it means that we have a real file. Real file in a Google Drive um, term terminology means that this is a PDF, this is a text, uh, like common files like doc, PPT, XLS, or CSV. But if the doc type contains a zero value, that means that we are um, looking at a folder. Okay, so other than that, like two, uh, two, three, four, five, up to 13 plus doc type value, that means that this is uh, kind of different types of Google files or objects. Um, as you may see here, um, I think I do have, yeah. So if you uh, see here on the guided images, um, or if you see on the doc type, you can see that I have a folder name called guided images. So that has a value of zero instead of one. Okay, so uh, those are pretty much the common storage or cloud storage applications. So now let's talk about how we can perform some acquisitions of these artifacts because we're just human. Sometimes we tend to forget things and uh, we might forget where are these artifacts or files being located on the endpoint. So we probably need some automation or kind of tool that does uh, the, the work. So. Uh, we have some um, cloud storage API collections or collectors uh, that we can leverage wherein we need to supply um, the username and password or the credentials for this uh, to be connected on the API of these services. So we have F-Response, which are uh, very uh, common. Um, this is also being used by law enforcement. Uh, so F-Response has the capability to collect such things. Uh, Celebrite is also an amazing platform uh, that we can use because they have their cloud analyzer just to get these kind of artifacts that we can use for the FIR thing. Uh, Magnet Forensics, the Axiom one, uh, they keep on having a various updates now and then. So they're pretty amazing. Uh, as speaking of Magnet Forensics, they have these, um, uh, they have their, uh, MV mentorship, I think, this week as well. And they're running uh, some of their own conference. So shout out to uh, Magnet Forensics folks out there. Uh, again, their Ma Magnet Axiom is very useful in terms of almost everything. Uh, they've collected a lot of stuff, but of course, uh, in cloud storage, they have their own um, set of features down there. Um, and Google, uh, like uh, when getting uh, some logs or artifacts from uh, Google Drive or any G Suite applications, there is this um, um, takeout.google.com or take Google Takeout. So this is a common uh, uh, collector of the logs that you need from any uh, like your G Suite applications or your even your Google Drive. Uh, I've put here uh, a GitHub repo of G Suite collector because I think this is amazing. I haven't tried this, but um, I've seen that this has been used by uh, most of the people around me. So they've been using this to perform a collections of artifacts on G Suite as well. So, you know, it's, it, it won't hurt you to try it. Um, so this is just a pretty much uh, the summarized version of the, how cloud storage or what are the artifacts that we can get depending on the cloud storage apps. So uh, yeah, pretty amazing that um, we can get uh, most out of it if we know where can we uh, where to look for or what to get for in terms of our um, investigations or uh, whenever we have an engagement or there was a time that a user that are infected or probably the images that we're receiving uh, from, from the IR side or from the DF side has been using cloud storage apps. So at least we know what are the things that we can extract from this depending on the application that they're using. Um, now the question is how can we acquire or how can we get these artifacts in a very fast manner? So um, Cape to the rescue. So if you haven't heard about Cape, then Cape is one of the best collector out there or one of the best tool um, um, of the decade, I, 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 would, I would say 
yeah, decade. Uh, it was written by Eric Zimmerman, so an ex-FBI and now uh, working in, uh, in crawl and uh, also working as a science instructor. So uh, Eric Zimmerman uh, create or he he wrote a lot of tools. Uh, he called it easy tools that was used uh, in so many aspects of incident response and digital forensics. So uh, I have a demo here which um, I will be playing right now. So let me just um, share my screen. So I hope you can see, okay, wait a second. Um, not this one. Okay, so this one. So uh, I'm here, uh, my local host. So, uh, um, this is just a demo of how I can acquire cloud storage artifacts. So as you can see that I have a Google Drive um, box, um, Dropbox installed on my local host. So how can I get those artifacts? Let's say I've been infected by something or I've been dealing with insider threats. So this is how I use Cape. So in Cape, there is a target and module. So target, um, this is... Um, uh, the, the things that we need to get or we're trying to acquire for uh, depending on the types of evidences. So right now, I'm trying to search for a cloud storage. So there is a section here called cloud storage wherein it will acquire all of the artifacts if the user is using Box, either Dropbox, Google Drive, OneDrive, and SugarSync, okay? So shout out to Chad uh, Tilbury and Andrew Rodman for uh, having these um, cloud storage section K. So um, yeah, so I've tried to um, highlight most of these cloud storage apps and then I hit execute in a bit. So once I check that one out, so that means that I wanna get those artifacts. Um, so I wanna put that on uh, a VHDX format and then I just have to put the base name or the, the file name itself. Um, once I'm done, once um, I know the target source, once I got the uh, target cape files, then it's about time to execute. So um, it might take a couple of seconds. So um, normally it would take, um, yeah, it depends on how large the files that you're trying to acquire for. Uh, but in my case right now, um, it might take less than a minute. So I'll just have to wait a bit. So uh, it runs in a background of like, it. Um, as you can see on the percentage here, this is the progress um, status. Uh, so as you can see, it's almost done. So in just less than a minute, I was able to acquire most of the artifacts that I need for my uh, investigation purposes in terms of cloud storage um, applications. So as you can see, the total execution time here is 40.3756 seconds. Very, very easy especially if you don't know where are those directories that you need or those um, directories or metadata that I've just discussed. So once you open the VHDX files, uh, you can see that I've acquired the artifacts from Box, from Dropbox, Google Drive, Microsoft. That means that I'm acquiring a OneDrive artifact. So I'm trying to check each of the folders here if I've uh, if I was able to get uh, things that I need to get. Uh, so now I'm opening Dropbox. Um, and yeah, this is how, this how easy it is uh, by using Cape uh, being created by, by Eric Zimmerman. So uh, I really recommend, I highly recommend this tool uh, when you're working for a DFIR cases or IR cases that you have there. So, um, yeah, that's it. That's my uh, demo. So let's just go back to my uh, presentation. Okay, so uh, this that actually ends my talk. So uh, do you have any questions? Do you have um, um, yeah things in your mind? So again, um, thank you so much for NerdSec for having me here. Uh, I just you know very very grateful and honored honored to be part of the speakers in NordSec 2021. So uh, watch out for our um, um, panel discussions later related to cloud security. So uh, I'll be waiting for your questions there. And again, thank you so much. If ever you have questions, just let me know.